Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our third webinar in a three-part series. Today's webinar is called How to Use Google Analytics to Redesign Your Website. Thanks so much for attending. We're, we're broadcasting live today from sunny downtown Markham. We have a lot to cover today, um, so I'm going to jump right in and get to today's topic. If this is your first time attending live, I'm Marie Weiss president of Marketing Copilot. And this is the third, as I said, the third in a series of three webinars on digital marketing that was put together by Marketing Copilot under the guidance of Trish Torrance for both the CFPA and the CPCA members. And I hope today's webinar will be the most powerful one in our series in helping you understand how to turn your website into your most powerful sales tool. A uh, couple of housekeeping items just for everyone to remember is uh, we will have a question period at the end of the session, so please hold your questions and you can type those right into the GoToWebinar panel uh, when we open up the session to questions. Uh, all presentation slides will be available on SlideShare and we'll give you the link to that at the end of the presentation. And the webinar recordings today will be uh, emailed to you, a link that we've been posting on YouTube following today's session. So um, please do share, share often, tell your friends. And without further ado, I want to jump right into today's topic. And uh, we're going to go right to the agenda. First of all, uh, on our agenda topic, I want to talk about the truth about website objectives. And I think um, item number one is going to feel a little bit odd that we're going to go back to strategy after having jumped into the, in the first two webinar series sessions about tactics and implementation around LinkedIn and specifically an implementation around email marketing. And I want to I want to roll the bus back up the hill a little bit and talk a little bit about objectives and strategy. Then we're going to turn our attention to collecting the right data, looking at different pieces of data that you should be collecting, how to analyze the website, how to make decisions, how to make changes and review results. And we're going to use a case study at the end of this uh, webinar that's going to be familiar to a lot of you and talk about how we use data, what we did and what the outcome was to use Google Analytics to improve our website and website results. So let's jump right into website objective. And this is a misconception that a lot of business leaders have, is that if I build a website, I will get closed sales from it. So point A leads to point B. And while that may be true in some cases, point A doesn't lead to point B without a lot of work. And it's a little bit, I've made this joke before, people have heard me say it, it's a little bit like going out on a first date with somebody and asking them to marry you on the first date. It takes time to build a relationship. And even though you can't look somebody in the eye when they're on your website and they're looking for information about your business or they've been driven there through an article that they read or they did a search in Google, the fact of the matter is your website still is building a relationship. And that relationship building process is not a direct line between point A and point B. And so before you start going and looking at data in Google Analytics, you need to understand this about your own website and your own web presence. Otherwise, you won't be able to pull the right information and you won't be able to make the right decisions. So let's dig into this idea of website objective a little bit further. Every business, regardless of what you sell, or who you're selling to needs, needs a new business opportunity pipeline. You need a pipeline of people that you can be consistently talking to over 12 months, 18 months, 36 months, who might eventually drop into a qualified lead and a closed sale. So the way we like to look at the new business opportunity pipeline is in these four main categories, lead creation, lead nurturing, sales process, and closing. And we believe very strongly if you are not a 100% commoditized business that sells a very specific product based on price, and you maybe have a more complicated solution or a wider set of products or services, the primary function of your website should be lead creation and lead nurturing. 
and that the primary function of your sales team who have to work closely with that website is sales process and sales closing. And the reason I bring this up is that we're still talking to clients today and prospects who come to speak to us about improving their website results. They still think that closed sales is how to measure your website. And that might be a good thing if they had a really strong lead creation and lead nurturing process set up. But without those first two building blocks, getting to the last two building blocks is going to be extremely difficult. So this is why we want you to sort of get in your head right now the primary function of your website. The first steps in building an opportunity pipeline are lead creation. And maybe you're doing things today to create leads. Maybe you're doing search engine optimization, which is an organic search process. Maybe you're doing search engine marketing, which may be more of a paid per click model. Maybe you're networking within your industry. Maybe you're running events. Maybe you've purchased lists. Maybe you're doing cold calling. Maybe you've done sponsored content online. But at the end of the day, regardless of how you've gotten in front of an audience to make them aware of your product or service, they're coming back to your website. And that's the process of lead creation and getting people to get to your website to see if they'll do something. Lead nurturing, perhaps you're doing email marketing, maybe you've got some social media going on, blogging, you've created downloads on your website, on, yeah, downloads on your website, you might do webinars, you might do workshops. But now once you've attracted somebody and they've decided you might be worth getting to know, You've got a series of steps that you're taking to nurture them. The customer's view of your sales process, the way they perceive you and your sales process is, first and foremost, they might view you as an order taker. They find, you know, they've completely decided what they want to buy. You may sell a commoditized product. They know very specifically that's what they want, the price they want to pay, and they're just going to call you to take the order. They might also be looking for a product expert, somebody who might explain to them that this is the kind of product you might be interested in. Maybe they're looking for a problem solver. They have a problem that they're trying to tackle and they don't yet know the solution, but they're hoping that you'll talk to them about different solutions to their problem. And at the very last stage, they're looking for a strategic advisor, somebody who's going to give them really good advice regardless of the outcome of the solution. So if you talk to people in sales, they're trying to move themselves up the ladder from number one to number four, because the best place to be in a sales situation is a strategic advisor. So the goal inside your new opportunity pipeline is to raise the profile from order taker to strategic advisor. And the higher up you go, the thinking is the easier it is to close the sale. So that's why it's really important to start thinking about these steps within your website. Does your website fulfill these things today? And if it's just order taker, hi, here's who we are, passively read some contact, click here to contact us and call us, then it's going to be harder and harder for you to build that relationship, even if it is online. So these are the things that we want you to be thinking about as you're now starting to figure out, based on these steps, where do I want to mine data to figure out how to fix things? This statement is really important to us at Marketing Copilot. I think if you take anything away from this webinar today, we'd like you to go back to the team that's working on your website and say, how do we measure our website's performance? And again, the mistake that a lot of business leaders make is measuring the website's performance against closed sales. But you should be measuring your website's performance against lead nurturing, not closed sales. Because it's not the job of your website to close a sale, that's the job of your sales team. It's the job of your website to create a relationship over time so that you can hand sales ready leads to your sales team. And that's really, really important to think about as you're deciding what to change on your website and what data to look at. So the first thing we want you to do is we want you to take a minute and write down today what you think your website's objective is. And it can be one of these four things. And keep in mind, though, if it's number four and you don't have an e-commerce component to your site, number four is going to be really, really hard to achieve. But it could just be education or thought leadership. You could be trying to establish yourself in the industry as somebody who's got a new idea, a new process, a new way to do things. It could be purely lead generation that you're looking to build names and build a list. 
It could be that you've got a list and now you're trying to nurture it over time. And if your goal is sales, as I said, there's a lot of steps and a lot of complexity in there to actually use your website to close a deal. So you want to think about all these things carefully. So let's talk a little bit about where you're going to gather data from. There's lots of places today, even if you don't have a robust or a, a detailed analytics tool running on your website, there is still lots of places to gather data. And all of these tools um, that we're looking at right here are all relatively free. Um, Google Analytics is a free tool that can be set up on any website with code pasted onto the site. And if you don't have it running on your site today, I highly, highly, highly recommend that you go ask your technical team to do it. Um, a lot of times, two people have it running, but they don't know how to access it. Go figure that out quickly because there's gold in Google Analytics. There's really important information that's going to help you, and we highly recommend you find the way to access it and get into those details as quickly as possible. You can look at the back end of your website, particularly if you're running a tool like WordPress. There's data in there that you can go find. You might be using email marketing, and your email marketing has a lot of really valuable information about click-through rates and where it sent people and to what pages it sent people to your, on your website. You could look in your social media stats about what's happening there, and there's lots of other tracking tools. But figure out where you're going to gather your data first and foremost, and today we're going to talk primarily about Google Analytics. Here's the good news about Google Analytics. It's free. It's full of important and incredibly useful information, as I mentioned, and it provides markers about search engine optimization. And what I mean by that is um, Google is very self-serving. It, it may appear to be this tool that is for the masses to provide the best search experience, but at the end of the day, they're doing things for their own best interest. And so you can appreciate that any information that they're providing to you via Google Analytics, which, as I mentioned, is free and can be put on any website, there's a reason they're collecting that data. And there's a reason that those things are there. And so you can oftentimes understand markers about what they might be looking at to rank a site based on the data they're collecting. So that's why it's important to be looking at it, looking at it often. It changes really, really quickly. So that's part of the bad news. And the bad news is that it's tracking everything about your website, which is why a lot of companies, big, big companies in particular, have moved to proprietary analytics tools so that they're not sharing your data with Google. But in the most, for the most part, it's a good thing to do, but there, are, there is a downside to them tracking information on your website. As I mentioned, it's really difficult to keep on top of changes. I go in every week, and every week I see something new. Something's in beta. Something's changed. It's also tricky to manipulate. It, it, what you see is what you get. And yes, you can run some reports, and yes, you can set up goals, and you can do a bunch of things in it. But Google makes you play by their rules. And therefore, if you're looking for a more integrated approach to data analytics and reporting within your business, it might not be the be-all, end-all. Let's just talk for a second. If your goal was education or thought leadership, you would want to make sure that you're really clear on the market that you serve and the problems that they face. And that's where you might be wanting to share a lot of content and a lot of dialogue about how to do something different. You probably want to describe thing in, things in a way that no one else has done before. Thought leadership is all about bringing a new approach, offering something no one else is offering, and being compelling enough that people will share. So if you really have set a goal that thought leadership is what the primary objective of your website, these are all the things you're wanting to test for. This is, these are all the things you'd be wanting to mine data to figure out, is my story compelling enough that people have shared it? Have I offered something that's forcing people to give me their email address and download something? Am I talking about things in a way that's compelling enough that people are staying on the page? And we'll talk about that in a second. If your goal is lead generation, then you need to be thinking about community building, getting to know people and inviting them to come back. And if your goal is lead nurturing, you're trying to understand their needs, you're trying to figure out an ongoing communication of value, and you're always inviting them to take a next step. There should always be a call to action or something that you're thinking about. So what data do you need that helps you achieve your goals? And hopefully that by this point, you've given some thought to what the primary goal of your website is. Even if you work for a really large company, 
<clears throat> that has a lot of moving parts on your website and <clears throat> your organization has made a commitment to put a ton of stuff on the website, at the end of the day, you still need to figure out the primary objective about where you're going to drive people and what content you're going to use. So let's talk about the education as a goal, first and foremost. The types of things you might be wanting to mine out of Google Analytics to figure out whether your website's performing is time on page. How long did people stay to read stuff? Numbers of pages they visited. How compelling was the content and the way it was set up that people wanted to click around and read other stuff? Number of visits on the blog and education pages. This is where you'd be looking for data to figure out, is my goal of education and thought leadership working? Time on page. And we're just going to quickly show you some examples for each one of those bullet points. Are people staying on your pages long enough to actually read and engage with your content? So we've pulled some data here. Um, this is really from the back end of our Google Analytics tool that's measuring the Marketing Copilot website at marketingcopilot.com. And here you'll see that for returning visitors, um, we've got an average session duration of 10 minutes. That's huge. And I don't say that to kind of tout our own horn, but anything over a minute is really, really good. Because think about your own reading habits online and your own browsing habits online, how long you stay, what you're looking at. Um, new visitors, now we'll talk about the difference between returning and new later when we talk about lead nurturing versus lead generation. New visitors, three minutes is still really good. Over three minutes, three and a half minutes is still really good, but you can see the difference. And that is gonna dictate these are the, this is the data you're going to be looking at to dictate lead gen versus lead nurture. Number of pages visited is really important. Um, most people don't go past a page and a half on a website. And so if you can get to two, three, four pages, that's really important. And your Google Analytics will tell you um, what pages they were. These are links to actual pages that you're seeing in the numbered side of the chart. And then what you're going to also want to look at is um, what's the average view per that page. So how many pages did people go to? Did they bounce around and read a bunch of stuff or did they just come read one page and leave? And we'll talk about how you might look at that data in a minute. Page popularity is really important. What are the most popular pages? Are your blog posts popular? Is your educational pages popular, especially if you're mapping this back to a thought leadership strategy? The most popular page on a website is often the About Us page or the About Us tab. And so that's really important to think about because that's where you want really good content. You know that's where people are going to understand who you are. But then you're also looking to see what other types of content people are reading because if they're getting to case studies quickly, they're really starting to vet you now to find out what kind of solutions you offer. If they're getting to your blog on a regular basis, that's really important. So here's some data you want to be looking at just to see how well all the pages on your website are performing. And we've talked about this before where clients who put up tons and tons of pages on product, you want to go in and look and see if people are even getting to those pages because nine times out of 10, they're never even viewed. In which case, if they're not viewed, what are they there for? They're not helping in the sales process or in the buying process. So you want to make sure you know what the most popular pages are. If your goal is lead gen, you're going to want to look at things like goal completion, geography, where do people come from, keywords, visits by traffic type, and referring sites. And we're going to dig into this and I'm going to show you. So for those who aren't familiar with the idea of goal completions, it's something that you can set up in Google Analytics where when somebody does something, let's say, for example, they fill out a form. Let's say you have a contact us form on your website that says that here's how to get in touch with us and somebody can fill in it and submit it. You want that to be set up as a goal completion, meaning that somebody has looked at a number of pages on your website and then they've done something on your website. And this is really important because if your goal, for example, is lead generation, the number of goal completions is really important because those goal completions, particularly if they submit an email address, is leading to your lead gen um, goals. 
So you want to track everything. You want to make sure as many things on the website have a goal completion if it's, if it's possible. You want to map it to your buyer process, and then you want to look at steps in your buyer cycle. So for example, on our website, we have a number of different workbooks that we want people to download. But our main call to action is around driving people to content marketing and a content marketing workbook. So here for the goal completions as an example, and this was over the course of a two week period, we had more downloads on the content marketing workbook and less on some of the other things that were on the website to download because they were further into the site. So this tells us that our primary call to action is working fairly well and that we're seeing people complete goals on the site. Geography is really important as well, and this is one that I think is kind of overlooked in Google Analytics because <clears throat> some people need to have a really strong local search to their business where there might be other bigger companies who sell internationally or across Canada. And if you're getting traffic from the wrong place, then your keyword strategy is off. And this is where you really need to spend some time and figure this out. We've had some interesting places pop up in our um, geographic assessment of where people are visiting from and who's completing goals. And it's great here, for example, that Toronto is driving the majority of our goal completions, which for us is good. We like to sell across Canada. We'd like to be visible across Canada. But when you start to look at where some of the geography or the traffic's coming from, we feel we realize we're probably missing opportunities elsewhere to promote ourselves. And so this is where you want to think about your own sales strategy, who you're selling to, and make sure that geographically it's being reflected back in what traffic is getting driven to your site. Keywords are so hugely important, and we can't stress this enough. And we don't mean keywords around your product keywords, but what are people doing to find you? Which keywords perform? Um, keywords are very problematic these days in Google Analytics specifically yeah. because of this big ugly category that you're seeing here in the example that we're using called not provided. And what that means is that Google in its infinite wisdom, and this was back to my bad news about Google Analytics, is they manipulate it and they decide what they're going to show you. They decided to start hiding keyword searches from anyone who had been logged into Google at the time. So say you had a Gmail account, you'd logged into Google and you were searching on Chrome or even on another browser for something, and they're not showing the website those keyword searches. And they say it's in the guise of privacy, which just cracks me up because anybody who's had their house photographed for Google Earth and Google Maps knows that Google at the end of the day doesn't really care that much about privacy. But really what they're trying to do is they're trying to protect this data because they're finding a way to resell it back to you from an AdWords perspective. And so the keyword piece is a little bit tricky to just use straight up Google Analytics to look at your keywords. But you can kind of imagine that any of your keyword results that you can see, a combination of those keywords is probably what's making up the not provided category. So in this case, I've used two examples. One which is a good example and one is a weird example. So key ingredient of a strategic plan is a little bit generic. If it had said a strategic digital marketing plan or something like that, we would have been happy with that. But you can see why the session duration was only 12 seconds because it obviously the content didn't map back to what that person was searching for. And this other one that cracks us up that we've seen quite a bit in our analytics is what does a lion look like? And we, we uh, have worked with or talked to a gentleman named um, Marcus Sheridan, who runs a company called The Sales Lion, and we wrote a blog post called What the Sales Lion Taught Us About Content That Roars. And then suddenly we were getting searches for people saying, what does a lion look like? And you can see that they're bouncing because we don't have any content that tells you this. So it's really important to be looking at these keywords and figuring out, are the keywords performing to get people to read your content and stay on page? Visits by traffic types is really important because you want to know where people are coming from, specifically for lead gen, lead generation. You want to know, is it organic that's driving the best traffic? Is it social media sites? Is it referral? And here's just a little chart that breaks down. Uh, organic is blue. The green is website um, traffic. 
direct means that they're coming directly. They're typing your URL directly into a browser and coming to you directly because they already knew who you were. Referrals, social media, and then other. So we like to show this because a lot of times people will be spending time on something like Facebook and it's not really driving relevant traffic. And so we sort of say, you know, stop doing things that don't drive the right traffic to your site and see what strategies are performing best for you. In our case, we find email marketing performs extremely well to continually drive traffic and then hopefully share and do other things that we want on the site. Referring sites is an often overlooked piece of information in Google Analytics. And this is the equivalent of a person you know who is really generous about referring business to your company. And somebody might really like you and be a cheerleader for your business, and they might often rec times recommend you. Referring sites do the same thing. So that's why you should be looking to see which sites are referring traffic to your website today. In this case, one is a link checker that's going to look to see if links on our site are working properly. And the other is a nonprofit organization who's sort of friends of Marketing Copilot, and they're driving traffic. And this is really good because you can look to see who's referring business and is there a way to get more? Is there a way to find more places to refer you business? If your goal is lead nurturing, you want to look at things like new versus returning, subscribes, bounce rate, and DNS resolution. We'll talk in a second about what that means. <coughs> Excuse me. For lead nurturing, the best thing that you can, you can see in your analytics is returning visits. And you can see that the majority of sessions on our website is returning visits and they stay for 10 minutes. And that's really, really good news if your goal is lead nurturing. It's not such great news if your goal is lead gen. Because our new visits are probably two-thirds of what our returning visits are and they don't stay as long. So this is where you want to look at this data to figure out how it's performing today and what you want it to do going forward. Subscribes on the website, maybe to an email list or downloads, they're really, really important, particularly for lead nurturing. You want to keep people on your list and you want to keep people coming back to your website. Bounce rate is another one. Um, and I'll quickly take a minute and explain the definition of bounce rate. The definition of bounce rate is, re is uh, characterized by Google as somebody searched for something, they've decided in the page one search results to click on something, to choose that link to click on, and then if they hit the page that they've clicked through to, if they leave in, I think it's roughly five seconds or less, it's considered a bounce, meaning that they didn't see what they were looking for and their expectations were not met based on what they searched for and what they clicked through to. So we look very closely at bounce rate on our website because a bounce rate of about 40%, 40 to 50% is acceptable. Um, anything higher than 50%, you should really, really start to pay attention to. So in this example, we've circled the green, but in this case, the green is they're performing not bad. And we circled the red because that's the one that really stands out as to a piece of content that performed extremely well and was mapped directly to the keyword because our bounce rate was so low. So what pages have the highest bounce rate and why? Which pages have the lowest bounce rate and why? You want to be looking at all of those things. DNS resolution means that there's people coming to your website on an internet service provider that can be resolved by Google. And in most cases, you're going to see that they're internet service providers like Rogers or Bell or, or things like that. But if you're a large corporation or even a small business selling to large corporations, there's a lot of large corporations that have their own dedicated IP address. So you see them show up here. So in this list, the one that I'm most interested in is the one called the Canadian Marketing Association. And I see that they did eight sessions on our website, which was at a time when we were applying to become a speaker through the Canadian Marketing Association. So it's nice to see that they were coming to our website. We could see exactly what they looked at and how long they stayed and what our bounce rate was. Now, there's more sophisticated tools out there 
than other than just Google Analytics, which you can get to. Um, as you see down the left-hand side of the slide, you can see how to get to this information. It's under technology and then network. But there's great DNS tools out there that would track exactly who was coming to your website, where they were coming from, how long they were staying, and it would start to track if they were coming back. And that would be really, really useful information from a lead gen and a lead nurturing perspective. This topic of in-page analytics, I'm going to I'm going to pause and I'm going to kind of call out because not enough people know about this and not enough people are using this today. There's actually a function in Google. If you don't know about it, I invite you to Google it. And yes, I said that. I invite you to Google it. Page Analytics by Google. And the reason I invite you to do that is if you use a Chrome browser, there's actually a plugin in Chrome that allows you to plug in directly to this so that you could go to your website and see in page analytics right from your browser. And what this is actually doing is showing you really valuable data about what, where people clicked and what percentage of people clicked on what. And where this comes in really, really helpful when you're redoing your website or deciding how to use analytics to redo your website is you'll find that there could be things in your main navigation that people never click on. And that's a really important realization because if someone isn't clicking somewhere, why do you have it there? It's just causing distraction and noise and it's taking away from the ultimate goal that you want your visitor to take. So page analytics is a really great way to see exactly what's going on. And you can do a whole bunch of really cool things with this. So we've used our website again as an example, and I apologize that these numbers are really small, so it might be a little bit difficult to see, but you're looking at where people click. 44% of people who come to our website click on our logo. I have no idea why, but that's what happens. 5% click on our resources. Um, another percentage there clicks on the blog. Uh, a small percentage clicks on about us and then a small percentage clicks on the contact us and this is where you can see whether or not your conversion points are working and you can see very specifically where people click and what they do so that's the that's the value of in-page analytics and it can be used just within Google Analytics or as I say there's this new plugin to allow you to see something right within your browser so we've talked a lot about strategy, making sure you understand the primary objective of your website, what type of data you might want to start collecting based on your goal, whether it's lead generation, lead nurturing, um, or education and thought leadership. Now what we'd like to do to dive in to show you how to use some of this data to actually analyze your website. And as I mentioned, we're going to use the Marketing Copilot website as a case study. So just for those people who probably don't know, um, we launched our new homepage on November 1st, 2014. And so we tracked it for 60 days. So we tracked it from November 1st to December 31st. Now in our business, um, we find the slow periods in the year are... July and August and then December. So we were tracking during sort of December 15th to December 31st. We see a drop in traffic to the site anyways. Um, that's important to note because you want to know cyclically in your own business when you're getting high traffic, low traffic, all that good stuff. But we thought these 60 days would be a good 60 days. And we looked at the information. We took it away and decided in January what we were going to do. We built out what we wanted to do in February, and then we launched a new homepage in March. And the reason I just explained this to you is I'm just trying to give you a sense of timing, and I'm trying to give you a sense of, of level of effort and sort of the distance between A and B, as I, as I mentioned at the very beginning of, of the webinar. So our 60-day homepage analysis, when we used our in-page analytics, told us where people were clicking. Those little orange boxes indicated what people were doing on various parts of the website. And that was really important to understand, were they going where we wanted them to go? And were they using what we had provided? So here's just some numbers that we saw on the homepage. The observations 
that we had then as a result of in-page analytics was that the menu items were performing pretty well. The blog had the highest click-through, which was really important as a lead nurturing site. That's what we wanted, followed by about and resources. And we could determine what people were interested based on what they were clicking. And so we generally felt that the navigation was working properly. Visitors understood that they were supposed to click down to this call to action. So they were supposed to click through. Today it all starts here. And we wanted them to click down to see this. And then our next call to action was a presentation about selling in the age of changed buyer behavior. And we looked to see if you see those little white boxes, it says 0%. We noticed that that just wasn't performing. So visitors were not clicking to download the presentation. <clears throat> and so what we were able to determine based on other content that they were looking at is that maybe they didn't understand the value of the presentation or they wanted to learn more before downloading because we knew where they were clicking. And that section of the website just wasn't performing. We also thought that maybe visitors thought they need to give their contact details and they weren't ready to do that yet. So they were afraid to click through there. So the recommendations that we came up with was to remove the section, this section of the homepage and place a link to the presentation in a different area of the website where we thought the visitor might be more ready or more interested in that presentation because they had a firmer grasp on either what we did or what they were trying to understand about our message. And we, were, we could replace it with another download or focus on one choice only. The next section of our website said, give us your website for 12 months and we'll fix your digital dialogue. What we observed here was that visitors were not clicking on this link. So if you look back at this, maybe they didn't understand it was a link to click on, even though we'd done it in red and underlined it. It just wasn't powerful enough for people to say, I want to understand what this means. The language might have caused friction. There might have been fear around what that was. But they either didn't see it or they didn't understand the value of clicking on that link. And we could clearly see that in our analytics that there was a 0% click through on that. So what we decided was we needed to make our call to actions more action oriented. What were we providing them? Why should they click through? Because we recognized that it just wasn't performing. The next part of our website, the section on our website was get our content marketing workbook and download it. Now, there's a disappointing stat down there, 0%. That's heartbreaking. If we're positioning ourselves in the content marketing arena, it's heartbreaking for nobody to want that download. So again, we felt the results should be higher if this is our main call to action. And we felt people were jumping off before they saw it and that we weren't offering it in the right sequence of events. So move this download further up on the homepage to support lead generation and lead nurturing was sort of the decision that we made. The big aha moment for us as an organization when we dug into our information was to understand that there was confusion between what we were talking about around digital marketing and content marketing. And digital marketing to people means tactical execution of search engine optimization, AdWords, email, all that good stuff. And while that was part of what we did, our real focus is on making content better. And it's on making content better so that you can achieve lead generation or lead nurturing goals. So we needed to understand what was our best customer searching for. And when we looked at our keyword strategy and pages that people were reading, we realized that our best customer was searching for content marketing and we weren't being clear about what we did and we weren't being clear on the path we wanted them to take with respect to content marketing. So here's what we did. We aligned our keywords to what people wanted, not just what we do. So yes, we do digital marketing, but what they were looking for was help with content and content that led to lead generation and lead nurturing. So we redesigned the homepage based on our Google Analytics homepage analysis. We rewrote content based on our keyword strategy. We re-optimized the content based on that keyword strategy. And we didn't change what was working. We only changed what we could prove wasn't working. And that's really important. Because sometimes when you get somebody who comes in who says they want to help you redo your website or you're being asked to make changes, 
People want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's get rid of the whole thing and start over. But that is a mistake on two fronts. It's a mistake because if you haven't mined the data out of your current website to understand what's working, you're just going to be guessing. And the second thing is, if there's goodness in some of your search engine keywords and content and everything else, you don't want to lose that goodness. You want to build on it. So we decided to only change what was not working. So here's the steps that we took to revamp our keyword and content strategy based on what we had mined out of the Google Analytics data. We used a keyword tool to examine words, and we used a couple of tools above and beyond just what Google provides, because as I pointed out previously, that not provided category has become a headache for people, and there's not as good keyword data in there. So we have a couple of different tools like Market Samurai, a couple of other tools we'd be happy to share after the webinar that helps us look at keywords. We created a keywords that we think we had an opportunity to rank for that made sense for our website. And you need to go through the same exercise because there's going to be some keywords that you might like, but you have no hope in ranking for because they're so hugely popular. For example, I would never want to rank for the term personal computer. <laughs> I would never want to rank for the term mobile phone because those are just unbelievably competitive keywords. So you want to look at the ones where you think you can win. Map your keyword strategy to your content. What content is on the site today that helps support that? Reoptimize your pages for those words. And the other thing we did was we adjusted the blog name and the blog categories. And I'm going to show you in a minute why that made such a big difference. And we aligned our social media bios to reflect keywords. So everybody in the company who had a Twitter account, a LinkedIn account, our own company pages, we made sure that they reflected these keywords as, as well. And we created an editorial calendar to reflect the new keywords. So here's what happened. Um, this is a long version on the right-hand side of the overall homepage. But essentially what you need to take away is that we shortened the steps we made the call to actions more concise and action oriented with a clear value proposition. So here's the, the web page. The finger pointing down is now a clickable link to jump you down to the next section. We tweak the content on the home page. This part, instead of give us your website for 12 months, which seemed scary and a little bit aggressive, we revamped it to have a section that explained why you might want to let us help you with your content marketing. The next section was directly to get the workbook. And we tried to use some imagery that drew your eye in and why you might want to get it. And the before and after of our blog. So before it just said subscribe, strategy, design, execution. We took that away and we gave it a name, Content Marketing Digest Canada. Get important content marketing and digital strategy updates. We share best practices. You'll learn new conversion strategies. We gave them a reason to want to subscribe. And I think this is really important. A lot of people put content on their website and they don't give people a reason to do something or take a next step. And then we were very specific about giving people a free website evaluation. And that was anchored to our footer so that people would click on that if they were ready to take a next step, which is a pretty big next step, but it was down at the bottom anchored to the footer. So here's a few results that we've seen since we made all these changes and used our data analytics to make the same changes. We've seen better search results. We've seen higher quality leads coming to our website of the people who are downloading things. We've made it easier for current customers to share our blog, so therefore, our nurturing strategy, we're making it easier for people to invite other people to take part. And it's easier now to understand the conversion points on our website. We've cleaned that up and hopefully made that a little bit easier for visitors to our site. One of the results was we started ranking on page one within about two weeks for content marketing for B2B Toronto, which is something that we really wanted to rank for because we knew that that was really important. And we started ranking at the top of the page and we continue to remain there based on the content that we've been creating and how we've been driving people to the website and to the downloads. Um, the other thing I don't have here, and I apologize, but you should see then the goal conversion numbers have not only improved, but the 
quality and the types of people in those goal conversions has been much better than it was before. So we feel we're getting people to the conversion points faster and we're getting a better quality of person based on who's clicking through and what they're reading. So before we jump to questions for everybody, um, and please start thinking about your questions now, I want to just bring some closing thoughts together and I want to just have you think about this as a litmus test for your own process. Don't make decisions based on opinion. Use your data. And I can't stress this enough, and it's it's quite frankly a mistake that marketers make, and we should all have our wrists slapped for it. But we always want to jump to redesigning or rewriting something or redoing something. And you got to start with your data. What's going on on your site right now? What's working? What's not? Make an assumption or identify one thing you want to change and test that first. Now, I know we took away three different sections on our homepage to test, but we made an assumption that people weren't getting to the content marketing workbook, and that was the most important thing we wanted them to get to. So we wanted to fix that, and we, we identified that one thing, and that was as a result of coming back to our keyword strategy. Don't be afraid to test. You might have to re-change up your your home page three, four times before you get to where it needs to be from depending again on what your goal is, lead generation or lead nurturing. Um, you're going to have to test things to see if it's working. Use your analytics often. You don't need to be an expert, but looking at it once a year doesn't help you. And when I ask people about their Google Analytics, the minute they say, oh, I, I don't really know how to log in. I don't know how to get to it. Then I know right away the status of their Google Analytics review. And, and that means they're not looking at their data. And there's a cool little function in Google Analytics for anybody who manages this for you or if you manage it yourself where you can collect a top 10 list of, of data points that you want to see on a weekly basis. And you can set it up as a recurring report that gets emailed to you every Monday morning or whenever you choose to set it up. Um, and that, that's a really great little report because it just reminds you to quickly at a glance look at your top 10 data points and, and just be familiar with what's happening on the site. And a 30, 60, 90 day evaluation cycle works really, really well. Look at it 30 days, then 60 days, then 90 days. And at 90 days, you should be changing up stuff. You should be making new decisions on your website if things aren't performing well. We're going to open up the floor in a second to questions. But just to come back and remind people that they can get this presentation on slideshare.net at marketing co forward slash marketing copilot. Um, they can also speak to Trish, who's also going to be sending out a link to this presentation on YouTube. You can email us, marie at marketingcopilot.com, and you can always follow us on Twitter, where we do lots of updates. So um, I would like to formally open the floor uh, right now to questions if people want to type in their question and um, okay we've got our first question if that's all right I'll read it out and uh, I'll hopefully be able to answer it I see you have a pop-up subscribe box on your website is that working for building your list and what tool is it Thank you. That is a fantastic question because I want to bring people's attention to this great little tool that we've been using called Sumo Me. S U M O M E. And you can Google that. And it's a free tool that's a pop up box that asks people to subscribe. And we have been able to improve our conversion rate from zero, as you saw in the previous analytics to 3% over the last six months using that pop-up box. And we've added 100 new names to our email list as a result of that pop-up box. Um, and again, we that was going back to our analytics, seeing that nobody was using um, this tool on our site, uh, or you know, using the subscribe function on our site. So that's when we put this, this tool on. And the other cool thing about what this tool does, if you do go check it out, it also has a, a heat mapping um, capability to it that allows you to see where people are looking on your website. Um, we have 
Another question. Thank you, Juliana. Does the app, smartphone tablets, help creating a good website flow? Are they related or not to analytics? Um, I think you might mean the app I was just talking about. So I'm going to answer the question in two ways. What we've done, what we've done with the pop-up box is it can be timed. So we don't have the box pop up until somebody's been on the site for over 30 seconds. So it's not intrusive. And it does work on smartphones and tablets. Our site is um, mobile responsive. So it scales to the size of the screen. And that piece does come up in a nice way if you were on a, on a phone. And um, are they related to Google Analytics or not? They actually aren't. The minute you have a tool on your site that links to somewhere else outside of the core website, Google doesn't track it. So we have to go into the actual tool to track what's happening. But we don't need to do that because when people subscribe, the email information goes right into Constant Contact, which is our email platform, and we get the data from Constant Contact instead. So I hope that answered your question. I hope it wasn't too complicated. Um, okay, Juliana says yes, thank you. So I'm glad it did. All right. Do we have any other questions? Has anybody else on the line um, set up questions? I have one other question here. I think a really good one. We've had this question before. How do I set up a goal in Google Analytics? Um, we have a blog post on our website that steps you through the process of how to set up a goal uh, conversion in there. And I will make sure that Trish gets a copy of the link to that. So when she sends out the link to this presentation, um, people can go to that blog post and see how to set up a goal. Because goals are really, really important. Um, if you don't see how people are completing goals on your site, then you're likely kind of flapping in the wind with respect to whether your site's performing. And so even if it's something as simple as the Contact Us page as a goal conversion, you want to make sure that that gets set up in analytics and you're tracking it. Don't know if we have any other questions. Um, I'll pause for a couple of seconds right now. We're at five to one. As always, we like to start on time and end on time. So I don't think we have any other questions coming in. So I would like to take this time to say thank you so much to Trish for helping us put this series together. Uh, thank you to all the members of CFPA and CPCA. And uh, happy website analysis digging, if there's such a thing. Good luck and uh, happy trails. Thanks for attending.